Hello, everyone. Bienvenue tout le monde. Um, we will get going uh, so we can make the most of our time here today. Um, uh, so uh, thank you very much for coming today. I just wanted to let you all know that um, this panel discussion is being recorded and will be uh, distributed across various social media platforms. And just to ensure a smooth panel discussion, um, audio and video, video is being disabled for non-presenters. Um, however, uh, you are encouraged to participate by asking questions via the chat. Um, and as this is a Coalition Publica event, um, which uh, is uh, coming to you from Canada, uh, uh, an officially bilingual nation, uh, we will be um, uh, reflecting our Canadian context um, by having both French and English interventions today. Um, so how that works for us is we start from a place of respect and uh, acknowledging that though we might sometimes have difficulty communicating, we all have something uh, valuable to add to the discussion. Um, everyone is welcome to speak um, in English or in French as they prefer. We invite everyone, regardless what language they're speaking, to speak slowly and clearly, avoid the use of acronyms and jargon. And if you have a hard time uh, understanding something that was said, you are always welcome to ask for a clarification or a little paraphrase of what was maybe said in another language. So this goes for our presenters as well as our participants uh, when it comes to the Q uh, question and answer period we'll have at the end. So um, I'm your moderator today. My name is Jessica Clark. I'm the Senior Coordinator of Open Access Development at the Canadian Dissemination Platform, ERUD. Um, most recently, I was the Project Coordinator of Coalition Publica, which is a partnership between ERUD and the Public Knowledge Project to advance research dissemination and digital scholarly publishing in Canada. Um, while my current work focuses on journal publishing, my background is in scholarly book publishing, um, and I've previously held positions uh, at um, the University of Ottawa Press and Canada's funding program for scholarly books, the Awards to Scholarly Publications program. Um, I'll now ask our panelists uh, to take two to three minutes to introduce themselves and um, uh, include hopefully a little information about their organization um, with a focus on their mission and activities that um, touch on diamond open access or partnerships. So um, Sophie, come uh, to a premier dans la liste, vas-y. Hello, everyone. I am uh, the coordinator of the Mirabel Network, and I'm going to speak in French, as you suggest. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, donc, uh, Mirabel est un réseau qui rassemble une communauté de professionnels de l'information, au départ des bibliothécaires et des documentalistes, et maintenant rejoint par des éditeurs de revues, qui produisent une base de connaissances publiques. C'est une alternative aux solutions commerciales pour le signalement des journaux et des revues. Une base qui met à disposition des métadonnées ouvertes qui décrivent près de 20 000 publications périodiques, ce qui permet de repérer parmi ces publications des revues scientifiques en accès ouvert et qui permet de faciliter l'accès pour les publics, lecteurs, chercheurs et autres. Au, au départ, un de nos objectifs, c'était de mieux connaître les revues librement accessibles qui n'étaient pas assez valorisées au sein des bibliothèques et des outils commerciaux. Et aujourd'hui, bah, on propose également des services spécifiques en France pour accompagner les revues dans leur référencement, par exemple au sein du DOAJ. La grosse particularité de Mirabel, c'est de se placer non pas au niveau de l'article, mais euh, au niveau de la revue euh, et de décrire... Euh, pour chaque euh, une des revues, d'agréger toutes les informations qui sont pertinentes euh, pour des usages très différents. Informations descriptives, bibliographiques, euh, le titre, l'éditeur, l'ISSN, mais euh, aussi un gros focus sur les contenus disponibles en ligne, dont l'accès au texte intégral. Euh, 
Information également sur le modèle de la revue, politique de publication, frais de publication qui va nous permettre notamment de repérer les revues Diamant, sachant que toutes ces informations sont consolidées grâce au travail de chacune des personnes qui contribuent au réseau, puisque les partenariats sont vraiment au cœur du dispositif, comme le montre le M de l'acronyme de Mirabel qui vient du mot « mutualisation ». Voilà, donc euh, à côté de l'activité des membres du réseau, des partenariats extérieurs sont mis en place en France comme à l'international, dans tout l'écosystème de l'édition des revues. Et euh, tous ces partenariats favorisent la mise en commun à la fois du temps de travail, mais aussi d'outils, de ressources autour de données ouvertes sur les revues. Merci Sophie. Alors, Richard <coughs> Uh, hello, everyone. I'm thrilled to be here and participating in the discussion. My name is Richard Heyman. I am an associate professor and digital relationship librarian at Mount Royal University that's based in Calgary, Alberta, here in Canada. I do want to briefly acknowledge that I work on the current ancestral and traditional Indigenous territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tusina, and the Ayahe Nation, I'm sorry, the Ayahe Nakoda Nation, and this is also Métis territory. Um, so my role is sort of split between two main portfolios. Uh, the first half of that is I am a traditional uh, liaison librarian and participate in our library instruction program. I support our English degree, our film studies program, and our, our information design degree. Uh, the other half of my role is more traditionally aligned with scholarly communications and open access. Uh, I sort of serve as our campus library point person for all things related to academic publishing, open access, predatory concerns. Uh, basically, if it's in scholarly communications, uh, it comes to me, uh, though we do have others supporting open data and open education resources. My role involves directly liaison, liaising with students and faculty researchers. Uh, that includes workshops, advocacy, uh, informing policy, and sometimes writing policy, just generally trying to push for greater open access exposure and adoption across our university campus. Um, also, for instance, I originally wrote our first, our library's first open access commitment statement, and I currently administer our open, uh, uh, sorry, our Open Journal System Journal Publishing Program. Uh, that's for OA or Diamond OA journals only. And I also administer our author, um, our author fund for funding APCs. As a researcher, I also try to make my own publications as open as I can. I will say that today I'm mostly going to be speaking from my own perspective and not necessarily representing my employer writ large, but I do want to acknowledge that uh, I have support from them to participate in events like this. Uh, Mount Royal University is an undergraduate-only institution. We have 11,000, approximately 11,000 full-time learner equivalents, about 400 full-time faculty, and then a huge complement of uh, contract or uh, part-time instructors as well. Our library has a long commitment to open access. We continue to fund various initiatives related to open data access and uh, OERs, that sort of thing, uh, as part of our strategic plan. Uh, and that also extends to including specific budget lines in our overall operating collection budgets for supporting national and international open access initiatives. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Sharla? Hello, everyone. My name is Sharla Lair. I am the Senior Strategist of Open Access and Scholarly Communication Initiatives at Lyricis. Lyricis is a 501c3 nonprofit membership organization based in the United States that, like other consortia, strengthens the communities we serve by providing a connection infrastructure that leverages groups for greater impact through collaboration and innovation. Lyricis is a home to a wide array of vital community programs, content services, technology hosting, scholarly communication initiatives, and community-governed open source technologies. I am part of the content and scholarly communication initiatives team at Lyricis. Much of our work supports individual member institutions, advocating for fair and accessible business models and negotiating favorable license terms and pricing. The rapid growth in open access content models in recent years has had a major impact on the work that we do. The programs and services of keen interest to those we serve generally relate in some way to open. 
the diverse community of Lyricist members creates opportunities to develop meaningful, affordable, and sustainable programs in which all are included equitably. Lyricist membership represents the entire spectrum of U.S. higher education institutions, so we prioritize OA publishing models, particularly Diamond Open Access, because it works for a wide variety of organizations. One of the most notable of these programs is the Lyricist Open Access Community Investment Program, which is a funding infrastructure for Diamond Open Access journals. Lyricist seeks partners and communities whose principles not only align with our own, but that use principles as catalysts for change by leading through transparent governance structures, facilitating inclusive discourse, and empowering a multiple stakeholder community to broaden impact through collaboration. Lyricist is in an organizational position to bring scale to open access efforts. Our work in this area often reaches beyond Lyricist membership, and opportunities are available to any organization in the United States, and in some cases, any organization in the world that wishes to join these efforts. Increasingly, we are forging strong strategic connections with other mission-aligned groups, such as peer library consortia, partnering with them to advance programs of shared interest around open access and open infrastructure and achieve scale at the U.S. national level. These collaborations provide more extensive benefits for the communities involved and pave the way for even greater scale in the future. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, and uh, last but certainly not least, uh, Jean-François. Bonjour, bonjour à, à toutes et tous. Je vais aussi me présenter en français, puis je passerai peut-être à l'anglais après pour les, les questions. Euh, je suis, euh, comme Richard, je suis bibliothécaire à l'Université de Lorraine, qui se situe dans le nord-est de la France, près de la frontière avec la Belgique, le Luxembourg et l'Allemagne. Et je suis responsable, euh, comme c'est indiqué sur euh, la diapositive, de la mission d'appui à la recherche, qui euh, s'intéresse beaucoup aux questions de sciences ouvertes, et donc, nous sommes une équipe en tout d'une douzaine de bibliothécaires et on travaille sur les publications scientifiques, sur les données de recherche et également sur euh, les logiciels, les logiciels de recherche. Sur la question de l'open access, euh, notre stratégie, elle, euh, elle, elle concerne principalement la voie verte, le green open access, donc à, à travers l'entrepôt de publications que nous avons mis en place il y a une dizaine d'années et qui est un, un sous-ensemble de l'entrepôt HAL, euh, puisqu'en France, on a beaucoup d'infrastructures nationales. Donc, pour les archives ouvertes, nous avons euh, HAL. Euh, dans le domaine de l'édition Diamant, nous avons également mis en place un, un dispositif pour soutenir les revues de l'université, pour les encourager à, à, à passer en accès ouvert et en accès ouvert diamant. Et enfin, pour ce qui concerne le Gold Open Access, notamment pour les APC, euh, notre université a pris une position assez critique par rapport aux accords euh, transformants, ce qu'on appelle les accords transformants. Et nous avons euh, notamment euh, décidé de désabonner notre abonnement à Wiley euh, année, cette année et de réinvestir la totalité des économies vers euh, des logiques de partenariat, et vers des logiques de soutien euh, à des euh, euh, infrastructures, des éditeurs, des initiatives ouvertes euh, d'édition, mais également euh, euh, des initiatives concernant le logiciel ou les données de recherche. Et je pense que euh, cette notion de partenariat dont on va parler, elle, elle est pour moi le signe d'une certaine maturité du mouvement de l'open access. Euh, euh, on, on arrive à un stade où, entre les différents acteurs, qu'on soit euh, fournisseur de services, qu'on soit bibliothèque, euh, on, on souhaite travailler davantage euh, la main dans la main et euh, travailler ensemble euh, à, à une ouverture équitable euh, de, de, des contenus scientifiques. Voilà. Et je terminerai peut-être juste en disant euh, que pour nous, le modèle diamant, dont on va également parler, et le modèle de diffusion qui est le plus en phase avec les valeurs de l'université. Euh, et même si le modèle diamant a aussi ses propres défis, ses propres challenges, euh, c'est sans doute le modèle qui, qui nous paraît euh, le, le plus... Euh, poser le moins de, de difficultés à la fois pour les lecteurs et pour les auteurs. Voilà, pour ma présentation. Thank you, Jean-Francois, and um, I absolutely agree that the sort of growing um, network of partnerships 
uh, on open access is a is a sign of a maturing space where um, we are seeing a lot more um, collaboration uh, to to move to something uh, more values aligned. Um, so we're going to turn to our um, panel discussion in just a second, but um, first, um, Coalition Publica, as the organizers of today's um, uh, webinar, we wanted to share um, with everyone a little bit of our inspiration. So why this particular theme around partnerships um, for open access? Uh, in our context here in Canada, we have um, many partnerships, um, but two that are really important around open access. Um, the first is Coalition Publica, which is a partnership between RUD and the Public Knowledge Project, or PKP, um, to support Canadian journals in the humanities and social sciences in the transition towards um, uh, sustainable open access. And uh, the main way that we are doing that is by developing uh, a non-commercial infrastructure for digital publishing that combines our two flagship platforms. Uh, in PKP's case, that's uh, Open Journal Systems or OJS. And for RUD, that's the RUD.org platform. Another really important partnership is what is called the Partnership for uh, Open Access or shorthand POA. Um, this is a set of agreements um, between FED and library consortia that act as a, a catalyst and a stabilizer of open access publishing in Canada. And we, uh, it does this by providing predictable long-term funding to scholarly journals from library partners. Um, through the partnership of open access, libraries, journals, and infrastructure providers are collaborating to build um, an equitable, robust, and value-driven um, uh, open access publishing ecosystem. Currently, um, these partnership, uh, partnerships exist between RUD and three library consortia, um, uh, the primary of which is the Canadian Research Knowledge Network, uh, here in Canada, but we also have partnerships with French libraries through the Couperin Consortium and Belgian libraries um, with the BICFB Consortium. So to go a little bit more into um, uh, the Coalition Publica Partnership and how it works, um, uh, in the before times, um, there was PKP and FUD. They were both founded in 1998 with um, similar values to enable scholarly publishing in a digital age in an open way um, and complementary missions um, around openness, etc. Um, and we did collaborate on some earlier projects, um, which helped us see the value of building a formal partnership, which we established as Coalition Publica in uh, 2017. And Coalition Publica was designed to support the transition to sustainable open access, build open infrastructure for scholarly publishing using our two platforms, OJS and RUD but also to um, uh, provide textual data from our platforms for research purposes, which we um, share alongside um, a collection of data corpuses uh, with heritage and periodical texts. Um, and this was all with a focus on journals in the humanities and social sciences here in Canada both RUD and PKP continue to have uh, international collaborations um, uh, separate from Coalition Publica. A lot of what we do is support for Canadian journals um, and we offer them a, a suite of services with what we do. Um, we use our infrastructure, that being OJS and RUD, to help them publish independently online and manage their editorial process with OJS. And then RUD gathers the content, published independently in OJS, um, curates the metadata, disseminates it on a central platform, and ensures that it's preserved for the long term um, and provides uh, the uh, research 
library community with all of the platform services that it requires. Um, on the financial side, we have the Partnership for Open Access, which um, takes uh, the funds invested from the library consortia that I previously mentioned and returns it to the journals uh, that are participating so that they can pursue their editorial activities. And with these elements, we have a system that looks kind of like this. We have the two main partners of EDUD and PKP um, working uh, in coordination with university libraries to support Canadian journals um, to publish uh, in a robust way and to do so hopefully an open access. So that's a little bit about the inspiration that we had for today's uh, webinar. Uh, we were looking at our context here in Canada. We thought that it was interesting, um, but we also wanted to understand other perspectives, other types of partnerships um, going on around the world. So um, I'm now going to uh, turn things over to our panelists and uh, we will uh, begin our discussion. Um, so start with our first question, which I think everyone was hoping to answer. Um, in your context, who are the key partners working together to support open access? You can be as specific or as general as you like. Um, and we'll start with Jean-Francois. Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, well, well, regarding this question, for, for the first uh, uh, partner I, that came to my mind uh, because it was at the local level, uh, I, I was, uh, um, and namely the university press. So uh, we we are at my university re relatively late comers regarding. Uh, uh, open publishing because we uh, are, have launched our service to, for uh, Diamond Journals only two years ago at the library and our university press has uh, undergone a, a complete restructuration and now uh, they they are working to to um, with with open uh, uh, research books uh, so we we both uh, launched our open access policy uh, at the same time. And we really did that in, in a coordinated way. So the first actor was uh, for me, for the library, the university press, so that we can have a common uh, and a shared understanding of the landscape, uh, of the stakes and of the policy within the university. So uh, I have other uh, uh, partners that came to my mind at the national or international level, but maybe I first let uh, the other panelists uh, also answer the question. Thank you. And um, we'll uh, turn now to Richard. Okay, thank you. And hello again. Uh, I want to acknowledge that working in Canada and working alongside Jessica and Coalition Publica, a lot of the same supports and uh, partnerships that Jessica mentioned, uh, we also have access to um, through the Canadian Research Knowledge Network, for example, and the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. Um, so when it comes to partnership, I do want to start something with very local and also acknowledge our um, our technical host for our open journal system for our uh, Diamond OA um, sorry, our Diamond OA journals. Uh, a number of years ago, we ran into a problem where our institution, that is Mount Royal, could no longer sort of fully support the open journal system platform. And the team at the University of Alberta Library stepped up and offered to host it for us. Um, they're amazing to work with. And I think this is the epitome of a partnership. Um, they've been super helpful. They've helped connect us into greater areas of the community. Um, and while it is a partnership, we even have a signed partnership agreement in writing, um, I feel like we are the net benefactors of that partnership. Um, so I'm always truly grateful to then. Uh, more broadly, we again have a various uh, institutional commitments. One of the things I off often champion is uh, when it comes to partnerships and working alongside um, those that are interested in the open access framework is, of course, our researchers as well as our local journals. So supporting those as best we can, uh, winning over individual researchers one at a time is not a very effective or efficient model for forming par partnerships. But I have found that through that work, it's truly paid dividends. They are then willing to connect me to other researchers that are interested in open access and that sort of thing. 
Uh, regionally, nationally, again, there are many, many other organizations that I that I could acknowledge or speak to that um, that Jessica either touched on or hasn't. Uh, I also want to acknowledge the partnerships that I see existing within the community of scholarly communications librarians here in Canada. Uh, and while that's been around for a while, it uh, really sort of coalesced over the years of the pandemic when everybody came online. Um, I think there's 180 of us, uh, various librarians, library support staff, and other information workers in the online community. And I know some of you are here in this call today. Um, and I just appreciate the, the partnership uh, approach that we've taken uh, with that group. It's very supportive. Um, it's non-hierarchical. And when we have some leaders and shot callers within that group for certain, um, I've always felt wel welcomed and I've always felt um, that I'm willing to, con or that I'm able to contribute back and participate in that space. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Richard. Uh, Sharla. So when I was thinking about this question, um, I often, I, I come from a library perspective um, and I, I think about the difference in partnership and in working together or at working at the same time, let's say. So acting or working at the same time is very different than working together or in collaboration or in partnership. We've been acting at the same time for a long time um, through subscription packages um, where you have the scholars working towards that, you have the libraries working towards that. We all have our deadlines, all of the, you know, all of these, um, these, this, this impetus to act at the same time. But because it's been behind, it's siloed behind, you know, big commercial publishers, CRMs, we don't know who is acting at the same time. It's hard to find partnership in open access because we don't know who we've been acting with. Um, and so identifying those stakeholders is so key because even looking at these local initiatives, are we including, who are we missing? Who has been acting at the same time that we're not partnering with? And so because at Lyricist, we work with so many different open access programs um, and open infrastructure programs that there are a lot of ways where I've been experiencing partnership. And so I'm going to go with a broad level of who are the who, who could we potentially be partnering with based on who I am partnering with, you know, in other programs. And so, of course, this includes libraries, you know, getting them to act not only in at the same time, but with intention um, towards some kind of shared or similar goal. That's more of a partnership. How do we get engaged in that way with libraries? Library consortia, of course, are the same. But then at the institutional level, we're not always working with academic departments. They seem to be separate in other ways. And I'm working through a program where that they are part of the stakeholders and trying to keep the money in the system. Um, you know, they've been contributing particularly to the diamond open access ecosystem for a long time. How do we act together in partnership with them along with the money that comes through institutions through the libraries? Um, but that also includes research centers on campus, scholarly communication offices, research offices, open technology centers on, on campus, finding those partners or potential partners. And then of course we go into the pet publishing landscape or the communities that may form around publishing. So this is societies and associations, um, editorial boards, um, but also the publishers, particularly university presses, library publishers, and then those scholar led initiatives um, and how to engage with them as partner as we move together towards these shared goals of open access. And then finally, the open infrastructures themselves. We see this with Coalition Publica um, and, and, and spreading out from the infrastructures and how engaging. Um, so from a library perspective, how do we reach out to those open, open infrastructures to have these partnerships? Um, and then of course the elusive, um, maybe not in Canada so much, but in other countries like the United States funding agencies, um, and then finally, I've worked with some programs who very effectively have been working with the readers and the users. And after all, that's who we're doing this for um, in a lot of cases. 
are those who are using the scholarship, reading that scholarship. And there are some great um, programs where they engage with the readers through surveys, asking them, why did you access this content? And it brings so much more meaning to those partnerships and all the hard work that it takes to form them and to maintain them. Thank you, Sharla. Hey, Sophie, uh, qui sont les partenaires autour le réseau Mirabel? Alors, principalement, ce sont effectivement les membres du réseau Mirabel, donc à une échelle humaine ou individuelle, des professionnels, des bibliothèques, des universités, des laboratoires de recherche et de l'édition qui contribuent en temps de travail à ce cercle vertueux de, de, de tra... autour des données ouvertes sur les revues. Donc, on est plus de 350 contributeurs qui venant de 130 institutions euh, et qui mettons à jour des données, mais euh, l'idée, ce n'était pas non plus de refaire ce qui est déjà bien fait ailleurs, mais vraiment de collaborer et de partager plus largement. Et c'est la raison pour laquelle, dès le début du projet, en 2009, quand on a lancé Mirabel, euh, des partenariats ont été mis en place avec les plateformes de revue aussi, pour récupérer ce qui pouvait l'être automatiquement, donc Open Edition, Percé, euh, Erudi, euh, Episcience, euh, des baissances pour parler enfin, des, des principales, mais ce ne sont pas les seules. Euh, et à côté de ça, on travaille de façon poussée aussi avec euh, des, 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 des instances nationales et internationales. Je pense notamment à l'Agence bibliographique de l'enseignement supérieur pour la France, à la Bibliothèque nationale de France. Et puis, euh, j'ai cité Érudit pour l'international, mais avec aussi le DOAJ, Sherpa Romeo et le Centre international de l'ISSN. Euh, Peut-être faire juste, euh, j'aimerais faire un focus un petit peu sur des, des collaborations qu'on a développées plus récemment avec d'autres réseaux professionnels au niveau français, donc euh, pour que ceux qui travaillent déjà ensemble se regroupent pour travailler encore plus ensemble d'une certaine façon, euh, notamment le réseau des métiers de l'édition scientifique euh, publique, le réseau Médici en France, et puis le réseau Repère aussi, euh, qui fédère des pépinières de revues scientifiques, euh, puisque ce réseau repère, c'est un peu la même dynamique, euh, une mutualisation, donc euh, ce sont des revues diamants euh, qui sont diffusées dans ces pépinières, et ce sont euh, voilà euh, euh, environ 80 professionnels, éditeurs, documentalistes, informaticiens qui mettent en commun des compétences, des développements, des outils. Euh, et, et pour ne pas refaire les mêmes choses chacun de leur côté dans leurs universités ou dans leurs institutions. Donc euh, voilà, la plupart sont également dans le réseau Mirabel et euh, plus on travaille, plus on échange, euh, bah, plus on arrive à faire les choses de façon conjointe et pas chacun de nos côtés à refaire euh, le même travail de valorisation des revues en accès ouvert notamment. Quoi. Thank, thank you, Sophie. Yes, partnerships should hopefully reduce the amount of work um, uh, by eliminating duplication, um, though they in increase their work sometimes with the, the collaboration between different parties, uh, taking time and attention as well. Um, in that sense, does working in partnership around open access include or exclude by default, any certain behaviors or activities, um, which ones and why, in, in your opinion? Uh, Richard, we'll, we'll start with you this time. Uh, I think the, I mean, the most obvious and easy answer is probably, um, you know, partnerships that are still based in self-interest and siloing. Um, and, and I feel as somebody, perhaps is a bit naive, but as somebody who's been working in this space, for 10 years or so in uh, in my institution and with in uh, higher education more broadly i feel that there has been a ground shift uh in the approach to that sharing and partnership aspect through our consortia and through sort of more regional level deals and uh, agreements and that sort of thing um so I can think of, you know, when we were pushing for, for our institutional repository and, you know, wondering why there was no national infrastructure for this um, and, you know, constantly hitting up against, well, each institution wants to have their own space for their own researchers, which, of course, makes sense as an institutional repository. But the the scale and the ability to do more at a sort of regional or national level makes more sense. 
And more recently, we are starting to see these things uh, coalesce around things like uh, the open data sharing platform in Canada that's really brought together a wide uh, or institutions from across the country uh, into Borealis. And while each institution can still have its sort of own space within that, that is still a national level platform for researchers to share their research data, which is um, much, uh, to me, a much better approach than that siloing uh, approach that we've seen before. Our institutional repository now uh, participates in a more regional uh, repository infrastructure where, again, there's the larger infrastructure for the entire group of participants, and we have our own space within that. But, of course, that just increases access for all our materials and all those other institutions to everyone else as well, right? So that opens them up to the world by putting them in a larger collection, making that more um more accessible and more findable. And uh, that's the benefit of these kinds of partnerships is finding those collaborations that um, ultimately, and like Charlotte just said this straight, in terms of like serving the readers, serving our community, serving in Canada, the Canadian context, right? So the open access, the fact that research materials should be available to our taxpaying public is the common refrain that we hear over and over. And that's what we're trying to do. Um, and so if we, continue to insist on silos, that's just going to be a major barrier. And so I think, of course, that has to be excluded. Thanks. Et uh, Jean-François, est-ce que vous avez des, des idées autour de cette question? Um, yes, and I, I tried to answer in English. Uh, um, I think that uh, when, we, when it comes to providers, be it publishers or other type of providers, from a library perspective, what we would like to to see in, uh, excluded uh, in terms of behavior is what the behaviors that we dislike with commercial with commercial publishers or commercial players and i, I will only name two uh, that that i think should not uh, take place when it comes to partnership the first one is uh, being excluded do not have any say in the in the way for instance, of the pricing, in the way that the uh, the service is designed, in the way the service is evolving. So uh, it could also be rephrased that I think partnership involves uh, that the partners have a say in 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 the designing of the service. And uh, we have seen so many uh, services or publishers or. Uh, infrastructures having been bought or having completely changed their business model with then letting the universities, the researchers, the libraries having a st to struggle to find an alternative. And uh, I think this we do not want to, to see again. And I think there is a counterpart for the libraries. And I think that there are also uh, some behaviors from the library perspective that should not be uh, uh, yeah, should be excluded, and it is mainly from my point of view the free rider uh, behavior, meaning that you benefit from the infrastructure, you benefit from the diamond uh, articles that are freely available online for your patrons, but you don't want to contribute in on, in any way to the funding and to the sustainability of, of the system. And uh, I think uh, libraries should uh, commit in a long-term relationship, in a long-term partnership. And this is quite a struggle, and it, it's a challenge. And uh, I know that in times of uh, financial uh, difficulties with the inflation, with, with the, the current situation that we know, it is, uh, that there, it's always a strong temptation to say that others are paying uh, for, for this infrastructure. And then maybe I can cut uh, this support or I can uh, make uh, what's, what looks like an economy, but then it, it, it makes the whole ecosystem more fragile. So th this is, uh, yeah, partnership uh, should be like a trust between two partners and in a long-term uh, perspective. Thank you, Jean-Francois. Charlotte or Sophie, would either of you like to add some thoughts around this? Um, question of behaviors included or excluded around open access? No, we'll go on to the next question. Um, uh, this one, this question is specifically for Jean, Jean Francois and Sophie. Um, uh, uh, comment est-ce que la langue influence les partenariats? Um, par exemple, uh, 
quelles sont vos expériences de travailler avec des partenaires dans la francophonie ou peut-être avec des partenaires dans des régions qui ne parlent pas le français? Um, Est-ce que ça change la dynamique des partenariats ou... Um, uh, Est-ce que c'est -ce est, euh, ça présente des opportunités qui ne sont pas présentes ailleurs? Alors, à vous. Sophie, peut-être en premier? Et oui, alors du coup, enfin, du côté de Mirabel, il y a beaucoup de choses peut-être à dire au, autour de la langue. Euh, donc, je ne vais pas forcément tout dire, mais déjà, on se rend compte de plus en plus que les outils de traduction automatique dans les navigateurs font que le site est consulté, que nos données sont utilisées par des non-francophones. Mais quand il s'agit de travailler en commun, là, c'est différent puisque nos interfaces sont uniquement, et, et notre communication est, un, est uniquement en français. Donc, euh, euh, c'est plus compliqué quand on cherche à travailler à, à l'extérieur de la francophonie. Et malgré cette facilitation de la langue, euh, notre objectif de départ, c'était d'ouvrir très largement euh, aux bibliothèques et éditeurs partout dans la francophonie. On se rend compte qu'à ce jour, euh, le réseau demeure principalement euh, français, euh, enfin, principalement en France, même si on a quelques membres au Québec, en Belgique, en Suisse, au Sénégal, et puis dans les écoles françaises, donc en Égypte, en, en Grèce ou en, en Italie. Euh, c'est pas qu'une histoire de langue aussi, il y a beaucoup de cultures euh, euh, et de pratiques métiers euh, auxquelles on doit réfléchir pour arriver à aller au-delà de la France et, et dans la francophonie. Euh, sur la langue, parfois, euh, il y a des projets sur lesquels on a travaillé où c'est parce qu'il y avait besoin d'un intermédiaire francophone euh, que Mirabel a pu se positionner, notamment pour euh, accompagner les revues Française a déclaré leur politique de publication dans Sherpa Romeo. Le comité pour la science ouverte a mandaté Mirabel pour que les revues puissent le faire en français euh, parce qu'il y avait un blocage euh, euh, pour certaines euh, du fait du, de l'écosystème anglophone en fait des grandes bases internationales. Et dans d'autres contextes, bah, justement, on a essayé d'aller euh, vers des partenaires à l'international pour donner plus de visibilité aux revues en accès ouvert françaises. Euh, et je pense notamment à un exemple assez réussi de partenariat avec euh, euh, Erudit notamment, mais également le DOAJ, donc avec des partenaires à l'international. C'est un projet Mirabel 2022 dans lequel on est pendant trois ans 14 partenaires, euh, dont 13 institutions qui sont francophones, mais une qui est anglophone, la DOAJ, qui a mandaté plusieurs collègues qui s'expriment en français de façon à ce qu'on puisse intégralement parler français au sein du projet et euh, voilà proposer euh, des interfaces euh, plus largement que pour la France. C'est pour ça qu'il y a Erudit dans le partenariat. Euh, et donc, euh, Erudit notamment, qui a travaillé sur des traductions, des interfaces euh, et des guides du, du DOAJ. Et peut-être juste pour terminer, je, ces dynamiques me rappellent beaucoup celles qu'il y a eu au Sommet mondial pour l'accès ouvert diamant à Toluca, euh, euh, à l'automne, parce que le multilinguisme était vraiment très présent, efficace, facilitant, parce que chacun s'exprimait dans sa langue grâce aux traductions, mais forcément avec ses limites, et je m'en rends bien compte, puisque j'imagine que déjà dans les auditeurs et auditrices de ce panel, il y en a qui ne comprennent pas le français et voilà, qui ne peuvent pas euh, voilà, euh, euh, percevoir euh, voilà, ce, que, ce que je dis de, de mon côté. Donc, c'est un frein, mais ça peut aussi être une force. C'est selon les, les cas. Oui, merci Sophie. Jean-François? Yes, um, so, um, so Sophie has already said a, a lot of things regarding that. And uh, uh, maybe I will just add that uh, in, there is also uh, the possibility, opportunities created uh, through networks that exist uh, within uh, francophone uh, disciplines. For instance, uh, I just had this afternoon a chat with uh, a network of the uh, medical, uh, the deans of uh, medical French-speaking uh, universities in, in uh, medical uh, schools. 
and they want to to have some discussions regarding open science in in their field, but in French. So with uh, uh, colleagues from the Maghreb, from uh, uh, Africa, from Quebec, from France, uh, Switzerland, Belgium. So uh, th there are some opportunities to also uh, through these networks uh, to to discuss open access uh, in a way that uh, uh, is uh, maybe also interesting in terms of relationships between global north and global south this is also the the, the way i i see it uh for now. yeah absolutely merci à vous and um for our um our attendees uh i'm about to go to our last question with our panelists so i encourage you to think of uh, the questions that you might like to ask them and uh, add those to the chat uh, as we uh, enter this last part of the discussion. So um, last question for today, at least from me, um, what do you see as the practical advantages of working in partnership around open access? We've actually mentioned a lot of them here, but you know, what are those really concrete things? that um, partnerships help us do that we can't necessarily do when we're working in those silos that, that Richard described. So um, Sharla, how about you first? Okay, so um, for me, I, it comes down to three things. Um, one is an increased ability to scale. Um, by working in partnership with multiple entities, what you're doing is you're working in partnership with multiple communities. Uh, you hear the saying, it, it takes a village, but in open access, I'm learning it takes many villages. And we want to retain the, the local um, and, and in the sense of the scholarship itself, the bibliodiversity. So we want to preserve that local and that those communities that have formed. Um, however, you want to be able to work together. And by doing that, you're, you're, you're basically, you're, I saw recently in a reading um, something that I read, you're, you're creating the equation of one plus one equals 1,000. Um, you know, this idea of being able to reach many individuals, um, at, at, but through those partnerships. Uh, it also increases the opportunity for diverse thinking and more robust approaches to whatever challenges we decide to, to take on together. That's why it's important who you choose to partner with. Um, we don't want to create echo chambers um, where, you know, everyone is Anglophone and they that's all that they can, you know, and they're all in the, the, the North, right? We need to be careful of that um, in order to actually foster diversity of thinking, but partnerships help with that um, by, by, you know, reaching across whatever boundaries we have set up um, and having the courage to, to go into that unknown in relationship with, with another entity to build and build trust. Um, and so by doing so, it, it only makes things better because you increase that diversity of thought. Uh, and then finally, shared responsibility, shared risk, and shared accountability. Um, by, by going it alone, you're taking it all on your own. And if it fails, there is no fail safe. Um, it's hard to do that. But when you do that in partnership, you're distributing that risk, you're distributing that responsibility, and you're distributing the accountability. Uh, again, you have to be careful who you choose to partner with, but hopefully that's that's established at the beginning that we are doing this together for good or the bad, like a marriage, right? Um, but in the end, what that does is that builds trust and respect and belief in each other. And then in those who you're serving, it can do the same with them. So for me, those are the practical advantages of partnership in open access. Excellent, thank you, Sharla. And uh, Richard, you had some thoughts you wanted to share on this. I do, I did. <laughs> They're mostly the same uh, as what Sharla has stated already. So I won't repeat um, there. I will think, um, you know, often, especially as somebody organizing and ministering our open access fund uh, and who's constantly aware of things like the serials crisis and the cost of subscription access, you know, we know these models are completely unsustainable, right? Financially, 
resource wise, everything. Um, and so one thing I'm constantly thinking about is sustainability. And so building off of what Charlotte just said, right, these things that allow us to bring together and build trust also allow us to work toward a more sustainable model for ourselves as those supporting OA, but also for the end users and the producers of that research as well. So bringing together that, that ability to have not group think, but a group of individuals or a group of organizations that then can contribute to a larger goal and knowing, um, especially since the number of these groups and especially in Canada, the community going are supporting these groups are doing this um, as part of their work or as volunteer time, having the ability to, you know, hand or count on one another, I guess, to have our backs to be able to say that if this is something I don't know or I can't take care of, knowing that the community is there to sort of fill in the gaps where necessary, I think that's a really important part of uh, the, or, and a really um, important advantage when it comes to sort of building overall sustainability through that knowledge sharing, uh, through collective documentation as well. There's efforts going on in Canada right now to make sure all of that is coming together um, so that we have that sustainable future. So our next generation of library and information workers, our next generation of researchers um, all can benefit from what we've done already and um, and can can see gains from the work that's been uh, done by their forebears. So sustainability is a big part of that for me. Thanks. Absolutely. Sustainability is a big um, a part of this whole conversation around open access and how to support it um, through different uh, streams, such as partnerships. Um, so now we have reached our question and answer period. Um, I will uh, remind our participants that um, you are welcome to answer your question, uh, ask your questions in English or in French. Um, you can add your questions to the chat and I will put them uh, to the panelists. If your question is for a particular panelist, please uh, include that. Otherwise, I'll assume that it's a question for everyone. Um, so to, to begin with, uh, we have one question for uh, primarily for Jean-Francois. Uh, in Canada, we have the feeling that the stakeholders most difficult to mobilize in favor of open access and especially diamond open access and therefore turn them into partners are researchers. Um, because prestige is historically associated with commercial international publications. I was wondering if the fact that your university took a stance towards commercial publishing by uh, opposing transformative agreements had an impact on researchers' perception of open access and the current dynamic and scholarly publication. Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, maybe I, I must make the... Uh say that we did not have a we, we are not opposed to commercial publishers per se because we we also strongly believe in bibliodiversity and we believe that there are room for every type of models but that diamond model in our is the most aligned with our values um so so the document and the the political stance that we we made uh, last year was against uh, read and publish or publish and read agreements we were but we were, we were sorry in favor also of uh, maybe more um, uh, progressive uh, deals with commercial publishers like subscribe to open uh, that we, we support. Uh, but regarding the, the the way that the researchers uh, receive these uh, these uh, political statements, uh, uh, it, it is very diverse. Actually, uh, we we have seen. Uh, some positive feedback from some communities, it, uh, uh, the usual suspects, I would say, mathematicians, uh, computer science. Um, we, we also have seen uh, some, we have seen some questions uh, saying, okay, wh what are you talking about? Because uh, the researchers are often not aware of the stakes they they see that okay oh i don't have to, to pay the apc because it's included in the deal but this is uh, for we try to show that this is a short term advantage but in the longer term uh, this could uh, uh, very is very likely to 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 turn towards a, a hindrance uh, something that is a, a disadvantage for for the whole ecosystem so 
we are trying to do uh, yes the, to to convey this kind of messages uh but we i must say that um it's really unequal uh, in the way researchers uh, are receptive to 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 this type of messages for the moment yeah thank you um and uh we not had another question but i may maybe ask um our other panelists if they have um any thoughts on this question of engaging researchers uh, around open access and some things that maybe have worked well for you or not. And then we'll conclude for a day. All right, well, I think I will leave it there. Um, we have reached our hour. Um, thank you uh, to everyone who attended today. Uh, thank you, especially to our pa panelists for making your time and your expertise available to us for this conversation. Um, I remain available to anyone who has questions um, coming out of today's uh, talk. So please feel free to email me. My email is on the screen there. Um, thanks very much uh, to PKP, who helped with a lot of organization, particularly Aruj Nizami, who ran our Zoom and had the idea for this session. So thanks, Aruj. Um, take care, everybody. Bye.